I, I believe that there is an attack on manhood in this country. And uh, I think it happens for a number of reasons. It's, it's going on for, for a number of reasons, and that's not really what I want to talk to you about today, but just understanding that on this day, this day that is about men and honoring men, uh, you know, we're doing a number of things. Um, there is a movement, and it's a good movement, to honor women in this country, to recognize the value and the importance on women. We should do that. Can, can I be really clear? Women should be honored and should be valued. They are not possessions and but what we have a tendency to do when we're not careful is when we choose to honor one, we feel like the only way we can do that is to dishonor another. And it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be, well, I'm going to choose to either honor you or honor you, but not both. No, the truth is we should honor all people. This is what the Word of God says, to honor all people. Uh, but if, when we're not careful, that's what we do. We pull men down in order to lift women up. Um, and we shouldn't do that. Now, the flip side of that problem is we need some men to act like men. We need some men to uh, be godly men and godly role models in this country. You see, I, I don't think the solution is to dishonor men. I think the solution, and, and you've got to know this about me, my entire worldview is a biblical worldview. So every problem that I see is looked at through the lens of Scripture. Every issue that I face, every, every political problem, every world problem, every family problem, every personal problem, I look at through the lens of Scripture. So for me, the solution is to, is to, not, uh, is to not dishonor men, nor is it to just let men be anything they want to be, but rather it is to teach men to be godly men. Paul said it like this. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What we need is more men to stand up and say, I'm going to look to Christ so that others can look to me. Paul understood this principle that we are visual people. And so while we may hear the words of Scripture, while we may hear the, and read the words of Scripture, we need to see it in action. So we are to be Christ-like in everything we do, but the way we're Christ-like is we, see, we have role models in front of us that are being Jesus in the flesh. doesn't mean that we need every man to be perfect. In fact, none of us can be. But we need more men that are striving to be Christ-like, that are stri striving to be like the Apostle Paul, that are striving to be a man that others can look to. Jesus was that type of man. When I, when I read the story of Scripture, Jesus was not soft. Jesus didn't back up from a fight. But Jesus knew when to have compassion and when to be gentle. And, and he knew when to, to step into the, into the middle of it and get something done. I love looking at the life of Jesus. You know, Jesus walks into the temple and starts turning over the, the money-changing tables he gets a bullwhip and he is driving people out of the temple because Jesus knew when it was time to fight. I, if we're going to be like Jesus, I think we've got to be men that know now is the time to fight. Now, we've got a lot of men that will fight for no reason. We'll fight over stupid things. <laughs> but then when it comes to the important things, we back down, we go silent. Got to be men that know how to fight when it's time to fight. Secondly, this uh, they came to Jesus, and you may remember the story. They, they came to Jesus and they brought him a coin, had Caesar's face on it. And they're basically trying to trap Jesus. Because if Jesus says not to pay Caesar his taxes, because it was the belief that Caesar was not just uh, an emperor, but he was a god. So if you don't pay taxes to Caesar, you're not recognizing him as God. So, but if you do, from the Jewish perspective, you're saying that there is another God besides Jesus. Without going into the story, they bring this coin to Jesus and they say, Jesus, what do we do? And Jesus shows up with solutions to difficult problems. And he says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but render unto God that which, was, which is God's. We pay taxes to Caesar, but our lives and our hearts belong to God. Jesus had solutions, godly solutions. I love when they brought, and, and I, I love the story that when they brought the adulterous woman and they threw at the feet of Jesus, trying to uh, punish her, trying to treat her poorly, trying to mistreat her. 
Yes, she had been caught in the very act of sin. But here's the problem. Where was the man they caught her with? But Jesus stepped in with love and compassion, and he intervened for the one who could not intervene for herself. As men, we've got to know, and we've got to be able to intervene for those who can't speak up for themselves. Are you all right this morning? I, what does it mean? When, I, when I think about being a godly Christ-like man, these are the things that come to mind. Jesus, he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. He brought them to him. He sat them on his lap and he spoke to them. And in fact, he related the kingdom of God to them when everyone else was pushing them away. Jesus found importance with the people that no one else did. Jesus healed the centurion's servant, but he also healed the Jewish beggar because Jesus treated all people equally. I was listening to a story, and it's the story from a historian who spoke to Pontius Pilate. When Jesus came before Pilate in the moonlight, Pilate said to this historian that he wasn't a big man, he wasn't an imposing man, he wasn't a man of massive physical stature, but he said, when he came walking towards me, I saw liquid love in his eyes. And I respected him more than any man I had ever seen. Something about Jesus. It wasn't that he was shouting. He didn't even have to say a word. When he walked into the room, you could see love in his eyes. But you respected him before he ever said a word. I want to be a man like Jesus. I forgot my Bible. I might need that. But this is what I see. More than, more than Jesus, people, this is what I see. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Here's the problem. We're, I, we're looking at role models that look more like this than the Jesus I just described. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. When I look around and I look at the supposed role models, I see more of this than Jesus. I see more people like this than I do like the Apostle Paul. But my encouragement to you is, for every man in the room, be like Jesus, not like what the Apostle Paul was writing about. And I want to give you some ways that God can help you do that. Because the question is, how did Jesus live his way and not fall into this trap? Do you think that times were more difficult now than they were when Jesus was walking the earth? Because I don't. Do you think it's harder to live for God now than it was then? If you think so, let me tell you this. They killed Jesus. As of yet, no one's tried to kill me. No one's tried to throw me in prison for speaking the gospel. And yet in Jesus' day, in the apostles' day, in the disciples' day, that's exactly what took place. So we can't look at life and say, well, Pastor Randon, that was for a long time ago. That was old stuff. I, I don't have to live that way anymore. The, the, the Bible doesn't understand what I'm going through. Let me tell you. The Bible is the only book, it's the only book that, it, that transcends generations and time and cultures, and it continues to not only be relevant, but to be powerful. So how did Jesus do it? How did he walk the earth in such perilous times and still be a, the man that he was. Why didn't he cave? My answer to you is this. 
because he had the power to do so. This power rested upon him. Two weeks ago, I spoke to you, and I, and I read to you from one of my favorite verses, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power. If you're in the room today, and, I, and, I, and I'm looking through the lens of men, but what I'm about to tell you can help everyone's lives, so don't, don't write it off, well, it's Father's Day and he's just speaking to men. No, I'm going to use some men language today, but ladies, what I'm sharing with you can help you in your life. And the reason why is because when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, whether men or women, whether young or old, we receive power. Remember, we talked about this power. It's called dunamis, D-Y-N-A-M-I-S. We get our word dynamite. It's explosive power. It's also power that is inherent in the nature of God. So when the Holy Spirit rests upon you, when he fills you, when he baptizes you, power is inherent in your life. So how was it that Jesus was such a a great man in difficult times? He was able to be great because of the power of God that rested upon him. You see, we find throughout Scripture that Jesus very rarely relied on his divinity himself. Even though Jesus was God, he stood in his humanity, but he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Do you remember, and this is not in my notes, guys, so just hang with me, but do you remember when Jesus was baptized and John the, baptized, John, John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan River? And when he came up, the dove flew down and rested upon him, and the, and the Father spoke out of the heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Here's what John the Baptist said of that scenario, of that, of that scene. He said, we know this was the Christ. Because the Holy Spirit, specifically in the form of a dove in this moment, descended upon him and remained. So when Jesus was walking in this dunamis power, it was the power of the Holy Spirit that was resting upon him, just like the power of the Holy Spirit wants to reside in you and reside in me. Are you tracking with me? So I'm going to give you a couple of things that the power of God can do in your life. Two weeks ago, I spent the entire sermon trying to convince you that the power of God is on your life. Now I want to show you some of the benefits of the power of God. Would you like to know how the power of God could be at work in your life? Because we often think like the only thing we think about the power of God is, well, if I need healing in my body, then, then that's the power of God at work. And if he doesn't heal me, then the power of God is not at work in my life. Well, that's one of the ways. In fact, that's the first thing we see that the power of God can do our, in our lives. The power of God can heal in your life. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Luke chapter 9. Are y'all with me this morning? Am I talking too fast? I can slow it down if I need to. Luke chapter 1. One day, Jesus called together his 12 disciples. Watch what he does. He gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I want you to go back to verse 1 there, and I want you to look at the last three words. He gave them the power to heal all diseases. Say that with me, all diseases. Not some diseases or a few diseases, but all all diseases. The first, the first power that I want to show you is that God has given you the power to heal all diseases. That, that starts with any sickness in your body. The best remedy for you may not be medication. It may be for you to lay your hands on yourself or lay your hands on your family and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm not against medication. I take it all the time. But I don't take medication in lieu of the power of God. My faith and my trust is in the power of God, always. My faith and my trust is in in the power of God, not doctors and not medicine. Now, what I also believe is that if God wants to guide the hands of a doctor or anoint the mind of a doctor, I don't care if the doctor is a Christian or a not Christian. When it comes to me and my family, God is in control. Are you tracking with me? So go, if you're going to go to the doctor, go to the best doctor you can find. 
and then trust that God is going to speak into their mind even if they don't know it. I don't even care if they give him credit. This is about my life, and my life belongs to the Lord. Are you with me? But God gave us the power to heal. But I love this word, this word disease here. Notice he said he gave them the power to heal all diseases. I said it a little differently that time. See, we say disease, but it's actually two words put together. Dis, ease. The word dis means this. It means a part, a way, negative, or a reversing effect. To, to take it away. So whatever you had, it's taking it away. It's, it's reversing it. It's taking it from a positive to a negative. Are you with me? Ease is this. Ease is freedom from labor, pain, concern, or anxiety. Ease is comfort. So I want you to notice what Jesus is saying. He's not just saying, well, when, you're, when your kids get sick, lay hands on them that they'd be healed. Yes, you should absolutely do that. But he said all diseases... So anything in your life that takes away your freedom from labor, your freedom from pain, your freedom from concern, your freedom from anxiety, your freedom from stress, anything that takes away your comfort, that is a disease. And Jesus gave them power to heal anything in our lives. How many diseases? All diseases. He gave us power to heal all diseases. So as, as, as the father of my kids and as the husband to my wife, as the head of my household, when things come into our life that steal our, our freedom from labor and our freedom from pain, when they take away our comfort, when they bring anxiety, when they reverse the effect, when they take away the ease of our life, it's on me to say, because of the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in me, be healed to every area of my life. My daughter yesterday, uh, Friday night and, and Saturday, was playing a huge uh, showcase tournament. What that means is she's playing in front of college scouts all day long, which is crazy when you're in eighth grade going into ninth grade and there's college scouts lining the fence. And she called me. She's like, Dad, I'm so nervous. I can't move. My wife called me, Randon, you've got to do something. Because at one, one particular game, there were six scouts there. And yesterday, there were more than that. There were, there were college scouts everywhere. And this is one of her dreams, is to play college softball at Houston Baptist University. This is one of her goals. And she calls me, Dad, HBU is here. What if I mess up? It has taken away the comfort and the ease. She's an outstanding softball player. But the stress and the anxiety and the worry was taking her over her and stiffening her up. Then you can say, well, this is not a big deal, Pastor Randy. You know what? It is a big deal to her. Because we're talking about her dream right now. So what's my role? My role is to step in as father and say, Kennedy, I'm bringing healing to the situation right now. The power of God is stepping in. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Don't worry about what they're doing. You worry about the God inside of you. You tracking with me? I, I want to encourage you. And I, I use that example because I want to encourage you not to get caught up in just healing sickness, but healing all diseases. Stress walks in into the front door of your house and seems to take over. Whoa, 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 hold on a minute. I'm praying right now that the power of the Holy Spirit would step into this room and heal everything that is taking away the ease of this family. Your marriage is struggling. You're, you're fighting. You don't even know. You ever had one of those days where you just woke up and you were in a fight? No, just me? I'm not a morning person, so I'm, I'm prone to it, okay? I, I'm, you, just, you just wake up. You're like, I don't even know what just happened. I know y'all do. Y'all are all, some of y'all are looking at me. Some of you are like, amen, preach. And some of you are like, no, Pastor Renan, my marriage is perfect. I have never fought. <laughs> and if you're sitting next to one of those people, I advise you to move over just a little bit in case the Lord comes on down. Uh, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Lindsay, hang on a second here. I don't know what happened to me. I, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I woke up the other morning. This is about two months ago, and I was, I was just really upset with Lindsay. And she's like, Randy, why are you so upset with me? We just woke up. And you know what I realized? I had had a bad dream, and I was taking it out on her. And when I put all the pieces together, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I don't even know. I know y'all think I'm perfect, and most of the time I am. This is, I'm just telling you about the one time 
There was, there was one time I messed up. It was one. Oh, what we ought to do is say, hang on a second here. Let's reset this day. Let's reset this moment. There's stress coming into our life. There's anxiety coming into our life. There's something that's taking away the ease of our life. And we pray and say, God, heal the things that are taking away the comfort, the ease. That's the kind of God we serve. Then he goes on to say, he, he goes on to say that he sent them out. Can I tell you? that you weren't just given this power for yourself? Know a lot of people that pray for themselves. Know a lot of people that pray for their immediate family. But you know what we're supposed to be doing in the world? Preaching the gospel and healing all diseases. You, I, I, as I told you, it was a difficult week this week. On, on, I had two major situations going on in my family this week, starting with my grandfather, just the pressure and the weight. And if you've lost a family member, you understand what that's like. In the very middle of that, I had another uh, just very, very difficult situation blow up in my family. And so I'm on the front lines of dealing with that and navigating through that and trying to, trying to bring healing and, 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 and wisdom to that. And so by Tuesday afternoon, I was so completely exhausted. My, just, my, my brain is tired. You ever, you ever get there where you just... You, you just want to take a nap. And so I decide I'm going to get away for, for a couple of minutes. And I go to watch my daughter, and she's at her high school softball camp. And so I'm thinking, you know, no one's going to know me there, really. I'm just going to sit in the stands. I'm just going to forget about the world for a minute. Do you ever need a time like that? And I no more hang up the phone from the final conversation of the, of the afternoon. Take a deep breath. Then a guy walks up to me and says, I am so glad you're here today. I'm like, oh, man, I'm glad you're here today, too. You know, my mom being pastoral, you know, I'm like, welcome to Triumph. I mean, hang on. Um, and he says, no, I saw you yesterday, but you had to leave because you were going to the funeral. And he said, I, I didn't think you were coming back because you were supposed to be going out of town today. But he said, you are an answer to prayer here. And for the next hour and 20 minutes, God put me in a place to heal the disease in his life, the thing that was taking away the ease. And here's a, here's a grown man, grandfather, um, strong man on the side of a softball field with girls everywhere, and he's crying his eyes out. I don't even, I didn't even, I'm looking around going, what just happened right now? But God put me in a position in his life to heal the thing that was stealing his ease. I didn't have the capability I didn't have the words to say, but the power of God in me did. My encouragement to you is this. Look for opportunities, for God has sent you into the world to heal all diseases. When someone asks you, man, can you pray for me? Can I challenge you? Don't say, yeah, I'll pray for you, and walk away. You look them right in the eyes and say, no, let's pray right now. Let's, let's pray right now. You know, most of the time people go, oh, right now? Yes, right now. Because God's going to, we don't need to wait till later. The power of God is here. Well, I, we're, we're in the refinery right now. I don't care. The power of God is here. Why? Because he came in here with me. The Holy Spirit walked in here with me. Well, I, I'm at school today. You can't do this. Watch me and reach across, grab them by the hand and say a prayer. It doesn't matter if you say it perfectly. It isn't about the words you say. It's about the power of God in you. You were sent into the world to preach the gospel and to heal all diseases. I, I want to encourage you today, if you want to be a man of God, a leader, if you want to make a difference in this world, don't go out making money. Go out healing all diseases. Amen. Number two, I have notes here somewhere. Where'd you go? Number two, the power of God can restore. The power of God can restore. I want to take you to Luke chapter 1, verse 17. This is actually a story about John the Baptist, but I, I want to put it into perspective for you. He will be the man with the spirit and the power. This word power here is the same word dunamis. It's the same word. That it, that this Holy Spirit power rested upon Elijah in the Old Testament. It descended and remained upon Jesus in the New Testament, and it baptized 
uh, the, the, new, the, the, the new church and you and I uh, it, after, the, after the resurrection of Jesus. It's the same word, the same power. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn, watch this now, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Now this is a reference to Malachi chapter 4. I'm going to read you these verses because um, John, uh, Luke didn't give us the whole verse. He assumed that we knew it. So let's go back to Malachi now, and, and here's what he says. He says, you will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, big picture, what Jesus is doing when he came, this is, and what John the Baptist was doing was, it was a message of repentance, but it was really a message of restoration, restoring the relationship between God the Father and the children of God. But what, what Luke is also saying here and what Malachi is also prophesying here is that there's going to be a shift when the power of God doesn't just heal the relationship with, with the Father God and His children, but you see a restoration of our earthly relationships when the hearts of the Father is turned back to the kids and the hearts of the children is turned back to the Father. I don't know if you're in the room today and there is a disagreement, there is, there is division in relationships, in your family relationships, but I what I want you to know is that the power of God can restore those relationships. The power of God can bring two parties that had turned away from each other back together. You say, it's been too long, Pastor Randon, not for the power of God. For it was 400 years from when Malachi spoke these words until when John the Baptist came on the scene. But God did what he said he would do. I don't care if it's been four days, four weeks, four years, or four decades. Can I tell you that the power of God can restore relationships in your family? And I want to speak for just a moment over, over families who the father is disconnected or the kids are disconnected. The father is away from God, or the children are away from God. Either one or both, if you're in the room today, I want to encourage you today, don't give up faith and don't give up hope, for God is going to do a restoring work. If you need a restoring work in your family, can you just raise your hand with me? I just want to say a quick prayer. Father God, right now, by, the, by your power that is within us, the power of the Holy Spirit, do a, a restoring work in families right now, whatever the situation is. You know the details, you know the ins, you know the outs, God. You know every situation. And I am releasing the power of the Holy Spirit to restore. He's going to turn the hearts of fathers back to the children and turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. You are restoring relationships in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Take that promise. Don't give up. God is doing a restoring work. Number three, the power of God can give hope. Romans chapter 13, verse 15 or 15, verse 13. I pray that God, the source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Watch this. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Over the last 15 years or so, you, you may have watched the explosion of the ministry of Pastor Joel Osteen at Lakewood Church. And one of the reasons for that is because the message that God put in his heart is a message of hope to a world that is in desperate need. Our, our, our nation, our families, fathers, mothers, kids, the world is bearing down on us. It has become dark and bleak and is stealing our hope. So suddenly Pastor Joel Osteen comes in and he starts preaching a message of hope. And it has reached our nation like nothing has in many years. You say, well, and he has people that don't like him and he's been attacked by other Christians. But look what, look what the scripture said. This, this is what Paul wrote to 2 Timothy. That this overflow of confident hope is actually the work of the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So if you're here today and your hope is low, it doesn't have to be that way. Put that verse back up on the screen for me uh, really quickly. I, 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 want to, I want you to look at it again, what he wants to do in your life. Hope, that thing that can drive you, it can give you energy. It can wake you up in the morning. It can cause you to dream again. It can cause you to want to live again. It's hope. And he said, look, you will overflow. I want you to turn to the person look next to you and look them right in the eyes and say, overflow. There you go. Make them really uncomfortable. Make it really awkward. Overflow with confident hope. You can, you can be the difference in your life. What is wrong with you? I am overflowing with confident hope. Why? The power of the Holy Spirit. Again, we get so caught up thinking there's no power of God if we don't see someone healed or resurrected from the dead. And yet here's one of the ways that the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in our life and we didn't even know it. We weren't even giving him credit for it. It's that we can overflow with confident hope. If you're down, if you're weary, if you're low today, I speak a word of hope over your life that the power of God would be at work when there seems to be no reason hope when there seems to be no way hope when it doesn't make sense hope and when the whole world disagrees you're going to overflow with confident hope can i get an amen this morning amen. number four the power of god can take the limits off the world wants to put you in a box the world wants to say, you can't do any more than this. The world wants to stop you. And God says, I have uh, ways and thoughts that are higher than your ways and thoughts. I have dreams and plans for you that you don't even understand. Notice what he says here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty, what? Power at work, where is it? Within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even think. Here's what that verse says. Here's what the power of God wants to do. Your thinking is a limitation. Because whatever you think, God wants to do more than that. So as big as you think it is, his power is even greater. So what we do is we think as big as we can. We think as big as we can. We dream as big as we can. We hope as big as we can. We plan as big as we can. And then we say, Lord, this is all my brain can handle. But don't let my brain be a limitation for the power of God that is at work within me. So the power of God is working through me in ways that I don't even understand. I can't even imagine. I can't even think. I don't even know to ask them. And yet the power of God is at work. There is no limitation in your life at what God can do. He is limitless. I want to speak over you and say that every limit, every ceiling that has been put on your life is being removed right now. Every, every, everything that the world has done to try to push you down that has impacted your thinking and impacted what you are even afraid to ask for, what you are afraid to dream of and pray for, I want to take the limits off and say that all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work in you right now. He's going to accomplish that and more. Dream big. Dream again. Number five. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, the power of God can save. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it, the gospel, the message of salvation, the message of reconciliation between God and the man, the message that, that the grace and mercy of God is free, his salvation is free to all of us. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. Understand this. I've seen lots of miracles in my life. I've seen blind eyes opened. I've seen deaf ears opened. I was in the service at one of our international conventions when I was a teenager. I was, I was standing on the stage holding a camera 
uh, recording when a lady was healed of cancer and the tumor literally fell out of her body in the middle of service. I've seen things that are hard to even wrap your brain around. A lady in our Triumph, uh, Triumph Church, Vicksburg, our, one of our sister churches, she had been pronounced dead for over an hour and God breathed life back into her body and she lived for another 20 or 30 years. I've seen things that would blow your mind. I know they did mine. And yet the greatest miracle that ever happens in the history of the world is the miracle of salvation. It is the power of God. It is the dynamite, explosive power of God. You were a sinner and you were lost and you were broken and you were hurting and you were headed for an eternity in hell and yet God intervened and through his power he saved your soul he turned your life around he healed your marriage he healed your body he got you on the right track and you'll spend eternity in heaven with him the greatest miracle the greatest uh, experience of the miraculous power of God that you can ever have in your life is when he truly saves you and changes your life Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. I read the ver first four verses earlier. Just put verse 5 up for me. Here's what he goes on to say. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. They act religious. The New King James, when I was when I was being uh, when I was uh, first studying Scripture and how how I was raised, my father read the New King James. He said they had a form of godliness, but they deny its power. I don't want to be a man that has a form of godliness, but denying the power of God in my life. I act religious. I act pious. I say seemingly the right thing. I look the right way, but denying and rejecting the power of God at work in my life. You see, one of the problems with men is we want to be in control. We only want enough of the power of God that we can control. We only want enough of this or enough of that that we can control. And when we get out of control, we want to step back and say no. But if we want to live like Jesus, if we want to live like the Apostle Paul, if we want to live like the Apostle Peter, if we want to live like the heroes of our faith, we don't deny the power of God in our, in our lives. We embrace the power of God knowing that God, with you I can do all things. Without you, I can do no thing. So my challenge is to every father, every husband, every man, kind of man are you? I'm not asking you if you're a religious man. I'm asking you, are you a man who embraces the power of God in your life? Starting with the power of God that brings salvation. I'd like it. every person in this room and every person watching online to close your eyes and bow your head for just a moment. Could these be words be spoken of you? You're religious, but there's no power. You might know scripture, but no power. You might come to church, but your heart is far from Jesus. Do you need a fresh start with God today? Do you need to experience the power of God, the power of salvation? If you want to start fresh with God and embrace all that he has for you, would you just slip up your hand? I want to say a quick prayer over you. Yeah, I see hands going up. I see men. And I'm talking to ladies too, and I see ladies' hands going up. If you're, if you're watching at home, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. We're religious, but there's no power of God. We, we, we know about Jesus, but that relationship has waned. You can put your hands down. I'm going to ask every person in this room, every person watching online, to repeat this simple prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I thank you for your life. 
that you came to this earth, but that you died for me. I receive the power of God. I receive salvation as your free gift. You gave it all for me. So now, Lord, I give my all for you. I give you my life, my heart, and everything that I have. I'll live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.